even know where I'm sleeping these days, so you gotta forgive me on that. It's great to be here. Thank you for taking the time to come out. I hear y'all have had a little bit of rain. And we've experienced your traffic. But we're still glad to be here. You know, I will tell you, it has been a whirlwind of a year. Next week, I will have been, been in the um, campaign for a year. And when I think about what that year has been like, we had 14 candidates. We've been able to defeat a dozen of the fellas. We got one more left. And you look back, we started in Iowa with 2%. We got to 20%. Then we went into New Hampshire and we had 43%. The more important part of that is our Republican incumbent, Donald Trump, didn't get 43%. That's a big deal. And so the night of New Hampshire, he was all upset because he said I was going to be 30 points down. And all he did was have a total temper tantrum on stage, talking about revenge. Then the next day, he goes out and says, anybody that supports Nikki Haley will be barred permanently from MAGA. Yeah. Now think about it. When someone runs for president, this is supposed to be a story of addition. You're supposed to be bringing people in, not pushing people out of your club. And so he does that. Then the next day after that, he goes and tries to push the RNC to name him the presumptive nominee. And then he... America doesn't do coronations. We're a democracy. We want people to vote. It takes 1,215 delegates to be able to, to be president. He now has 32, I have 17. We've got a ways to go before we get to that. Then the next day, he loses a court case. And he goes on a rant again. And all he does is talk about being a victim. The problem that I have with what happened in New Hampshire or what happened after the court case, was at no point did he ever talk about the American people. At no point did he talk about our debt. At no point did he talk about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. At no point did he talk about the open borders. At no point did he talk about the lawlessness in our cities. At no point did he talk about the wars around the world. All he did was talk about himself. And that's the problem. And then the campaign disclosures came out. And we saw that he spent $50 million of campaign contributions on legal fees for personal court cases. <laughs> Something's got to give, right? And then you see he surrounds himself with the political establishment. All of the congressional leaders are all around him. Every single one of them are responsible for the fact they've got nothing done. Look at what happened yesterday. Trump loses the case on having immunity for whatever comes next. <laughs> Republicans lose a fight on the border. They lose a fight on Israel aid. The head of the Republican Party loses her job. Everything that Donald Trump touches, it's chaos. Now, I'll tell you, all of those political establishment congressional members, I never expected them to be with me. Do you know why? Because I keep asking for them to have term limits in Washington, D.C. I keep saying we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75. And I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. The reason I say that is, right now, Congress has become the most privileged nursing home in the country. These are people making decisions on our national security. 
These are people making decisions on the future of our economy. We need to know they're at the top of their game. Or maybe it's those political establishment congressional members don't like the fact that I don't think they should be able to trade in the stock market when they have extra information. <laughs> Regardless of the fact Donald Trump can have them, it's you that I want. <laughs> Look at the situation we're in. We are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. Now, I would love to tell you that Biden did that to us. But I've always spoken in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you tonight. Our Republicans did that to us, too. You go back and look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability. They expanded welfare that's now left us with 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And did Republicans try and make it right? No. Nope. They opened up pet projects and earmarks for the first time in 10 years, pushing through 7,000 of them last December. Want to know how they spent your money? $30 million on an honors college in Vermont. 10 million to tear down a hotel in Alaska. Seven and a half million on a courthouse in Colorado. And the list goes on. In the 2024 appropriations budget, Republicans put in $7.4 billion worth of pet projects. Democrats put in $2.8 billion. Now you tell me who the big spenders are. All while one in six American families can't afford their utility bill, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 50% of American families can't afford diapers, Something's got to give. And Congress has one job. One job, and that's to make sure that they give us a budget on time. Do you know Congress has only given us a budget on time four times in 40 years? Four times in 40 years. You know what I say to that? You don't give us a budget on time, you don't get paid. Period. <laughs> I think it's finally time we had an accountant in the White House. The way we'll deal with our economy is we'll start by clawing back the $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are still out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, let's go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraudulently. If 8% of our budget is interest, Quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? We'll stop the spending. We'll stop the borrowing. We'll eliminate the pet projects. And I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. Then we'll take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the states. That will reduce the size of the federal government, but it will empower people on the ground. Think education, think health care, think welfare, think mental health. If we cut the strings and send them down, that allows states to do what's in the best interest of them without having D.C. bureaucrats making those decisions. And then I think we need to look at the fact that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We've got to open up the middle class. So we want to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. We want to cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. And we want to make small business tax cuts permanent. They made corporate tax cuts permanent, but they made small business tax cuts temporary. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. We have to start acting like it. And then when it comes to education, it's true. Only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. Only 27% of eighth graders are proficient in math. If we don't do something and do something quick, we're going to be in a world of hurt 10 years from now. 
In South Carolina, we knew if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So instead of pushing them forward, we started holding them back. We brought in their parents, we did reading remediation, and we set them up for success. We've got to do that all over our country. We have got to get our kids reading again. And no parent should ever wonder what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need complete transparency in the classroom. We will make sure every curriculum is online for parents to see. And parents have one job. That's to make sure we get our kids right. That's why they should be able to decide what mode of education or where their child goes to school. Let them have the rights to do that. And then let's start building things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back into our high schools. We had apprenticeships all over our state. We taught our kids how to build the things we were making, and we invested them in before they even finished school. And then when it comes to the border, it doesn't even look like the United States of America anymore. And let me tell you, I've been to the border, and I didn't pull a Kamala, go and come back. I went 400 miles down that border. You're not ready for what I saw. Mounds of clothes, mounds of shoes, paraphernalia, rape areas that the women and girls have to walk through. When you get up in the morning, you get your coffee and you watch the news. When these ranchers get up in the morning, they get their coffee and they see if anybody died crossing the fence. They pick up whatever little kids were left behind and turn them over to Border Patrol. I met with multiple sheriffs. They said before 7 a.m. they round up whatever illegal immigrants they can find, turn them over to Border Patrol, Border Patrol documents them and releases them until their court date years from now. And when I asked Border Patrol about their job, they said, you want to know what we do? We're glorified babysitters. They don't let us do our job. Eight and a half million illegal immigrants have come to that border. We had more fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. If we're going to fix this, we've got to go back to what I did in South Carolina. I passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. The way we'll do that is we'll do a national E-Verify, where businesses have to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. We will defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens. We'll put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. Let's go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That's how we'll stop what's happening on our board. And when I grew up in rural South Carolina, my parents always taught me to take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you for taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, 35,000 of our veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. A veteran needs a doctor's appointment at the VA. On average, it takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule. And the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. Now, I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan. And when Michael came home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When we got home, life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. 
He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. We gotta love them when they come back home, too. That's why we need to have telehealth, so they can have the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the best way we deal with VA health care, I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA, and you watch how fast that gets done. be the best health care you've ever seen, guaranteed. And then there were two things when I was at the UN that Russia, China, and Iran never wanted us to have. They never wanted us to have a strong military, and they never wanted us to be energy independent. We won't be energy independent, we'll be energy dominant. Let's get the EPA out of the way. Right now they care more about sagebrush lizards than they do if we can afford our utility bill. Let's speed up our permitting. Let's make sure we get our pipelines going. Let's set us up for success. No more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia. No more getting dirty oil from Iran and Venezuela. Her oil sell out. She's selling out to the fossil fuel if more show up. But let me tell you, don't ever get upset when you see a protester like that. Because my husband and his military brothers and sisters sacrifice every day for them to have the right to do that. <laughs> Being energy independent is a national security issue. But let's talk about national security. The world is on fire. Literally, we've got a war in Europe, we've got a war in the Middle East, we've got North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting the U.S., we've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that my husband and his military brothers and sisters who served there had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that said to our friends. More importantly, think about what it said to our enemies. And now you look and see what's happening now. We see it with Iran. The frustrating part about what's happening with Iran is keep in mind there would be no Hamas without Iran. There wouldn't be Houthis without Iran. There wouldn't be Hezbollah without Iran. They wouldn't be the terrorists in Iraq and Syria without Iran. And Biden fell all over himself to get back into the Iran deal. And when he did that, he lifted the sanctions. And China spent billions of dollars importing oil and filled their proxies with money. And Biden didn't do anything after one strike. He didn't do anything after two strikes, bless you. He waited 165 strikes. Three soldiers died. Two Navy SEALs are missing. And now he decides he's going to do something? When someone is deployed, we assume and expect America to take care of them. You've got all of these injuries and now deaths because he wouldn't do anything. So the goal should always be, how do you prevent war? Not how do you start war? Because that's what he just did. If we had stopped this in the very beginning, none of this had to happen. So this is a time we need to make sure that we're strong. 
We need a strong military. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. And that doesn't mean throwing a ton of money at the Department of Defense. It actually means cleaning it up, getting rid of the bureaucracy, getting rid of the red tape, telling them to quit playing favorites with defense contractors. And modernizing. So modernizing to make sure that we aren't listening to the generals of the past who think about land, air, and sea. We need to be focused on artificial intelligence, cyber, space, hypersonic missiles, submarines. That's how we'll take care of the threats of the future. So we know what we need to do from a national security perspective. We know what to, we need to do domestically. But the first thing is we've got to acknowledge some hard truths. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to win the majority of Americans is if we elect a new generational leader that leaves the negativity and baggage behind. Now, another hard truth. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But chaos follows him. Y'all know that. And we can't have, be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. And we also have to look at the fact we will have a female president of the United States. Hands down. All right, but hard truth. It's either going to be me or it's going to be Kamala Harris. Because if you look in any of the general election polls, Donald Trump can't win. Every one of them. He's down by seven to Biden. He's down by nine to Biden. Best case scenario, it's margin of error. He's dead even. I'm in every one of those same general election polls. And I defeat Biden by up to 17 points. Do you know what that means? That's bigger than the presidency. That's House, that's Senate, that's governorships, that's school boards. That's a transformation of government. But you win by double digits. We're going into D.C. with a mandate, a mandate to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track, a mandate to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics with education, a mandate to secure our borders with no more excuses, a mandate for law and order, and a mandate for a strong America we can all be proud of. Don't you want that? Because we could have that, but it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from every person here. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this primary. It matters. You know, seven months ago, I dropped Michael off for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they've never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, Shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. But what we have to acknowledge is everybody's got a choice. Now, first of all, there's a lot of people who only vote in general elections. They don't vote in primaries. In a general election, you have a choice. In a primary, you make your choice. That's the difference. 
And when you look at what you have to choose from, we can either go with more of the same or we can go with something new. More of the same is not just Joe Biden, it's Donald Trump. 70% of Americans have said they don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. The majority of Americans disprove of Joe Biden. The majority of Americans disprove of Donald Trump. Both of those men put us in trillions of dollars in debt that our kids are never going to forgive them for. And we're having to climb out of it. And do we really want a country in disarray and a world on fire and have our two candidates be in their 80s? No. We need to have someone who can put in eight years to get the job done and get our country back on track. So as we get ready for Super Tuesday, as we start to look at what's out there, just know I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this for the long haul. And this is going to be messy. And this is going to hurt. And it's going to leave some bruises. But at the end of the day, I don't mind taking that if you'll go right along with me. We will outsmart, we will outwork, and we will outlast. That is how we're going to win at the end of the day. You know, when I first announced, someone said, why are you doing this? And I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for Michael and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married, and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. The idea that the average buyer is 49 years old means the American dream is leaving them. Bless you. And I'm doing this for my son, who's a senior in college, and I am tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not us. That's not America. And for the first time, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I'll promise you this. If you will join our movement, go take 10 people to the polls. Send everybody you know to NikkiHaley.com to volunteer, to get involved, to get out, to do something about it. I promise you, I will spend every single day proving to you that you made a good decision. God bless you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.